what do you just in the big overarching thing if you're i'll get into the names i'll list all the players that are going to be there emil but big picture what do you want to see from ronald kuman against gymnastique on wednesday I mean, because it's preseason, we're going to overthink it, we're going to overanalyze it, and we're going to make it mean more than it does. Totally. <laughs> um, and I look forward to doing that. But, um, I mean, look, the, the, the spine of the team, I mean, these aren't kind of meaningful minutes for the veterans. I mean, because the thing is, guys aren't even necessarily getting back into game shape because it feels like they barely just – stopped playing so it's it's not like guys have had a long off season and they need to sort of get the engine fired back up i mean i think more than anything i'd like to i mean i want to see a hint of sort of of depth and i think and you know in in certain areas in particular kind of in the midfield and you know in parts of the attack but i'd say you know largely in the midfield where over the last what two three four years kind of Barcelona wound up with a little bit of a, not so much a hodgepodge, but kind of a, a log jam and just so many players. And it was, you know, you get guys who are out of favor or, you know, you get guys who fans in the media are clamoring to see playing more minutes and things like that. I mean, I know this is only going to be one game. It's one, it's one friendly and it's one exhibition, but I want to get a sense of kind of the, the depth, particularly in midfield. And I know because the, the frontline midfielders are going to be different from, from what we see kind of meaningfully against, against Gymnastic. But I think the, the notion is it, it'd, be, it'd be nice to know. And I think this is also true in attack because the defense is a whole other kind of situation where we need to figure out what that's even going to look like when, when the season comes around, kind of who's going to be on board and who's going to be gone. But I mean, I think I, I'm less concerned about sort of the, the, the implications for the starting 11 so much as I am kind of, I'd, I'd like to get a sense of kind of comfort and calm that there's there's depth behind, there's just sort of competent, stable depth behind, or, or at the very least, just kind of the, the framework of that, Where whereas we're not kind of always trying to integrate some, you know, sort of big money signing that may or may not have even fit at any point, but we got him anyway. And so we have to figure out what to do with him. Uh, it's funny, I've actually thought about this. There, there was a, and no one wants to hear about someone playing video games, but there was um, a, a few, uh, maybe three or four years ago, you know, I got the, the FIFA game and I was playing the, you know, the, the career mode. Mm -hmm. And you'd like, I played with Barca. And, you know, I'm like most people, it's fun to buy people in the transfer market. And I wound up with this weird midfield of like, eight midfield superstars. Like I had like, you know, Tiago and Pogba and Koke and like, and on top of that, I had Busquets and everything else. And it just kind of feels like that now, except these guys aren't pixelated video game characters. So they are people with agency and emotions who are frustrated and, you know, want to get on with their careers and their lives. And so I think, you know, that's one of the things that's happening is, you know, they're trying to sort that out at the, at the top end with the, with the big money guys, but it's still like, there's going to need to be backups and depth and support for whoever winds up being the, the starting, you know, the top three, four yeah. midfielders that, that are the frontline guys. And I want to see a sense of that. I just want to feel a sense of calm that when a guy needs a rest or if someone gets banged up a little bit or something like that, uh, or, you know, yellow cards accumulate and, that there's someone that can step in and just do a job, you know? I mean, if, if a star emerges, that's fantastic. But right now I'm not even trying to kind of shoot the moon like that. It's just, if there's just sort of good coherent depth and uh, just sort of fluidity in the play and just kind of a, a conceptual kind of buy-in and understanding what, of what the team is trying to do. Well, I think due to the international break, uh, not even international break, sorry, but the international tournaments this summer, yeah. we are seeing a much more B team heavy preseason yeah. squad than we normally do, especially in comparison to the last two seasons. Mm -hmm. So they haven't really released any real lists about who's available and training, but just doing a process of, uh, of elimination of who's not there, you can kind of figure out who's going to be available for this preseason friendly. So there looks to be Neto, PK, Umtiti, Dest, Roberto, Pjanic, and Puj from the first team. Again, mm -hmm. that's Neto. PK, Umtiti, Des, Roberto, Pianic, and Puj. And then from the B team, it's unfortunately not Kais Ruiz, 
came over from mm-hmm. PSG. I wanted to see him, but he is out with COVID protocol, which sees this, which seems to be the same fate for 19 year old center back Santi Ramos Mingo, who was injured for most of last year with Barca B, unfortunately. Um, but Inaki Pena, Arnau Tenas, center back mm-hmm. Arnau Comas, Alejandro Balde, who it seems to be uh, with his contract renewal underway. So that is good news since last week. Yep. Nico Gonzalez, Alice Callado. 16-year-old Gabi, who, for those who've been listening to this podcast, and particularly listening to the one with Naveed, know that we have talked about Gabi before. So to see him in the first team is not crazy. I know he's 16, but that's not insane if you've heard us talk about him before. And the new signing, Yusuf Demir, they're all part of first team training. So by my count, that's 15 total players, three of which are goalkeepers. Uh, so there could even be more B-team players on Wednesday, but I'm assuming yeah. all of those I mentioned already will feature in some way uh, shape or form against him. Nastique. That said, Memphis Depay, as we speak, is finishing up his medical. So I, I think he will also likely, I mean, he, again, as you said, he played two, three weeks ago for the Netherlands. So I, he will be probably in that match as well, making his Barcelona debut in that preseason friendly. So I think what we will see, this is my starting 11 here. I think we're going to see experience mixed with youth. So Neto in net, I can see Dest at left back to start, Umtiti, Believe it or not, I know the club wants him out, but I could see Umtiti starting instead of Comas because Santi uh, Ramos Mingo, Matt, rather, is uh, on the shelf right now. So, again, you're only really talking about Arnold Comas. So, I think yep. Umtiti will still start, even though they're trying to sell him. Maybe use that preseason friendly, send that tape around the world. Well, it's almost uh, like that's that's your one shot to kind of like you, you just hope, he, <laughs> right. you know, you, you hope he captures some of the old magic and you can just kind of snip that video and just be like, see, he's still got it. <laughs> yep. And then uh, next to Umtiti, I think it'll be PK, as I said. And then Sergio Roberto coming back from injury yeah. will play right back, most likely. And then the midfield, I think you have Pjanic, Nico Gonzalez playing the pivot, and Ricky Poos, the midfield trio. And yep. then up top, I think it'll be Yusuf Demir and Alex Callado up on the wings. And then probably Memphis to buy starting in the middle. If not, and Memphis is not ready to go, then maybe it's Callado as some kind of false nine with Dest out wide and Baldi as a left back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether or not they play a 3-5-2, whether they play a 4-3-3, uh, I expect to see some combination of, of everything that I just mentioned. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's time. Let's do the Yusuf Demir thing. He was signed on loan for one year with a 10 million euro option to buy. He's an 18 year old Austrian who came up through the rapid Vienna youth system, playing 38 times for Vienna's first team since 2019, scoring nine goals and four assists. He's all he's played across the entire front line in his time with rapid Vienna. um, But his most comfortable position is at an attacking midfield spot, uh, basically pulling the strings. Um, And, you know, (laughs) of course, we saw that people were calling him the new Pedri. But actually, Kaiser Ruiz coming from PSG plays a much more similar style and in similar yeah. positions to Pedri, where being on the left wing, that being Kaiser Ruiz, being on the left wing as Pedri was for Las Palmas, but also being at his best in the middle as a left interior. Demir is much more of a guy who's going to play farther even up the field than mm-hmm. Pedri was even comfortable at Las Palmas. He is kind of a forward. He is kind of a yeah, winger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, he is a number 10. He's really, I mean, about everything I, I, I watched of him that I could, and many of it was just highlights. I mean, even his Austrian debut, I tried to watch just five minutes against the Fairway yeah. Islands and, and no disrespect to the Fairway Islands. Actually, a credit to them. They ended the game 3-1, but again, <laughs> he only got 5-1. So the only real game I've seen him in the entirety of the game was December 2020, a Europa League game against Arsenal, which Arsenal won 4-1. Now in that okay. game, Demir didn't get too much of the ball. And honestly, I didn't learn much from it right. <laughs> of what I saw. I mean, at the time, I think there might have been one whisper about Demir potentially coming to Barcelona as of December, mm-hmm. or that might have even been March. Um, but he was 18, so I was watching for a young prospect uh, in that kind of match. That's what I usually do. Um, to, and he isn't even that tall, basically the same size as Pedri, but yeah. very much like Pedri, very much like Puj. He does a really good job of putting his body between the opponent and the ball, and he knows how to draw a foul. So yeah. let's start there. Um, but what I did like in that Arsenal match is that he wasn't afraid to dribble into space. He mm-hmm. basically, I think, if Rafa Vienna was given a green light, that he probably won't get at Barcelona, if you ask Trincao <laughs> or some of those other players. Um, but what I did see, too, is that though he did get himself in trouble with dribble sometimes, he did make the early decisions with a pass as, he's, as he was receiving it quite often, where he, he knew mm-hmm. where to play that pass, and it was often the right decision whether it was a 15 yard pass straight up the middle uh, and his, his forward passing seems to be good. And it seems to be, again, usually the right decision, which is something that you tend 
not to not only be able to teach, but it's also a skill that translates well for an 18 year old. So those are the things that I, I think are going to work out. The big question that you and I were discussing, though, here before uh, before we started recording is that between I know Kaiser Ruiz is in uh, COVID protocol, but he could still do some of the first uh, first team training. But again, he's yeah. 18 and had played first team football with PSG. So Kaiser Ruiz, you have Demir, who again is one of the biggest prospect in world football that Barcelona were able to get on loan potentially for a $10 million buy, a 10 million euro buy. And then you have Pedri as an interior. And then you have Ricky Puj. You also have an attacking midfielder from Granada, 20 year old Antonio Aranda. So you have at minimum three players who could play it to and Gabi as well, who could play for Barca B as an attacking midfielder. And then adding Puj needing time for the first team as well. That's now five attacking midfielders between the ages of 18 and 21 years old, which I, th- I think is quite interesting to have uh, yeah. four different players that profile at the number 10 spot. And yes, probably only one of them will be not even a consistent starter because Busquets and De Jong and Pedri are the starters. Nico Gonzalez and potentially Hondra Orion if he resigns, which he has not yet done. Maybe he will. So that guy is going to be the pivot. But you're not going to replace De Jong or Pedri for 10, for 10 years at this instance. That said, no. the depth of the attacking midfield, I'm interested to see which of those players not only become the regulars and the starters and the heroes for Barca B, but which players most likely Demir push into the first team picture first. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, kind of like you, I mean, I, I, have, I haven't seen Demir play kind of, when I say live, I don't mean in person, but even just kind of in, in real time or sort of with, with a great deal of kind of consciousness of, of who he was. His was a name that I had heard. And then when he became real for, for Barca, I kind of, you know, as we do, I, I took to YouTube and kind of tried to, tried to glean what I could. And my takeaways were kind of similar to yours in that <clears throat> he is sort of, he's a good distributor. And I think a lot of his sort of the, the flaws in his game or the mistakes that he makes uh, tend to be more from youth than from kind of some sort of like innate misunderstanding of how to, how to play the position. So I think with that, I mean, he needs, he needs reps. He needs, he needs time and just time against the higher competition. And because I do think that, and I mean, you know, we're probably going to wind up talking about this a little bit, but I mean, just kind of once we get an idea of what the, what the squad itself is going to look like for the La Liga season, you know, if, if they're able to clear out some of the, some of the big money in midfield, there's, you know, some logical, there's logically just going to be some, some spaces opening up. And so even if he just spends time with the senior, with the senior club, almost irrespective of, of just how many minutes he gets, ideally you'd like to see him get some, but just simply being involved in training at, at kind of the highest level. And with, you know, with guys with the skill level and, and honestly, just the experience and wisdom of, you know, Messi and Busquets and PK and, you know, those guys and just hanging out with De Jong and, you know, hanging out with Pedri, like it's, that's going to help him just in his, just kind of in his development and his evolution. And so, I mean, I'm, he's one guy that um, is absolutely fascinating to me. Also, uh, Nico Gonzalez is yeah. of, of great interest. I'm, I'm fascinated to see kind of how, how he plays in, in the role. I mean, if they, you know, if it, if the lineup is kind of as you as you laid out, which makes a lot of sense, uh, I'm really interested to see kind of how he slots in there and what you know what his comfort level is, sort of just jumping in and and playing that role. Yeah, I'm interested to see him in front of PK because usually yeah. he'll drop even deeper in support of Comas and mm-hmm. in front of Ramos Mingo, whoever it may be, with Roger Vieira a lot last year too at the end of the uh, in the spring. And so I'm interested, yeah, to see Nico Gonzalez and playing in front of PK most likely and what yeah. that experience behind him does mm-hmm. for him as, a, as the defensive midfielder. Um, yeah, so I, I think of that, I also want to remind people when it comes to Champions League this year, maybe some in the Liga, but as I, as I always say that I prefer they playing with Barca B than they are sitting on the bench for the Liga uh, unless the yeah. coach does plan on playing them and it's not mm-hmm. very conditional because I think there were times where, and it kind of, not ruined his fall, but Conrad de la Fuente was night and day better in the spring for Barca B than he was when he was 
fluctuating between the first team and the B team and sitting on the bench yeah. in every La Liga match and then never made his La Liga debut. And he sat on the bench like 16 times last year, only coming in the Champions League. Uh, so he did make his first team debut, but it was never in the Liga, that being Conrad De La Fuente. And, you know, these players don't like to just sit. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter what a 17, 18, 19 year old, 20 year old wants, but we know that development wise, it's not great for them to be sitting on the first team bench and never featuring. And especially if they're playing in first team training, like Yusuf Demir is going to be in first team training, even though he'll be yeah. with the B team, he's too good for the Spanish third division. Um, that said, I want to remember for Champions League, instead of Mateus Fernandez, who with the extended um, with the extended bench in the Champions League, Mateus Fernandez was on the bench for almost every Champions League match. I want to remind you that he was not injured this year. He was available yeah. all the time. <laughs> and, and he had his shin pads, he had his cleats, and he was sitting yeah. on that bench. That spot now is going to go to a young player. It's almost a guarantee. Uh, yeah. Even if they bring somebody else in, and even if they can't get Pjanic off the books, it's going, that spot is going to go where instead of knowing that Mateus Fernandez isn't going to come into the game, let's say Barcelona really turn something out, uh, you know, turn up the heat. And now they're winning four, one or four, nothing in the 85th minute. Now you're talking about debuts that Mateus Fernandez just wasn't going to get. He was 22 years old. It wasn't going to make any sense to play him even for one minute, other than the one game he played against Dinamo Kiev for what, 15 minutes, just to see him, you know, having made this 8 million euro move and to finally just get on the field uh, for, for good measure. So yeah, I expect to see a lot of the veterans, but that said, I mean, the list that I mentioned are names that I've been excited to see for not even a while, but I mean, Gabi is, how do I say this? I don't want to overhype these players. I'm always very careful about overhyping the yeah. players, but there is in this batch, a bunch of players that for a while now we can see have first team potential. So Gabi, he's 16. Don't worry about it. Just let him make his preseason debut. It'll be fun. I'm really excited to see him. I'm really yeah. excited to see him playing again uh, next to veterans, playing next to talented players. So Gabi is certainly of the level of the Spanish third division or higher, and he's 16 years old. I'm excited to see him. And in three years, I think he has a potential to be a member of the first team, maybe even two years. Who knows with him? Yeah. Maybe even next year. I mean, he could debut this year. He's that good. Then Alejandro Balde, he's the best left back prospect that Barca have had basically since Juan Miranda, uh, and we know his story. And he's still a first team professional at Real Betis, so Balde yeah. is going to be a first team professional somewhere. He's still just seventeen, so again, wait on him. That said, he could be the backup for Jordi Alba as soon as uh, this, this spring if he really yeah. progresses uh, quickly, and he could even get spots in the fall if he is able to make his debut. Uh, Arnaud Kamas had a really good season last year. I'm not sure what his long-term prospects are. Ramos Mingo is one with a little more potential. But again, Kaiser Ruiz is a guy with a lot of potential. Demir, as I said, is one of, I mean, the preeminent attacking midfield prospects in world football. And then Kayato, on the other side of it, 22-year-old who's waited his turn. And it's finally his turn. It's He's yeah. a guy that players have been pining to see. And again, Ricky Puj, can he finally... After some discussion from Laporta and Kuman, can he finally uh, become not a guy that plays 10 minutes, but a guy that comes off the bench and plays 35 minutes? That's what you want, right? right? You're just for Pooj, you're arguing for the extra 15 minutes in every match. Um, so can he stake that claim? And as you mentioned, of all this whole bunch, Nico Gonzalez is the one that Kuman seems to be speaking about the most, at least behind closed doors, at least in the media. And so to see him become, we've waited for a long time for the heir apparent to Busquets. And right. if, if it truly is Nico Gonzalez, well, obviously I'm excited to watch that. So, uh, okay. yeah, I mean, I think this is a, this is a group of prospects that uh, of the, of this bunch, you know, Francesca said it many, many times, if one of the eight or 10 or whatever in a generation make it, then that's a successful generation because of the big money signings that Barca makes, but with their financial problems, if you can get three or four out of these seven, that I and think these are guys that have the potential to do that. And right now you kind of need three out of seven, you know, just kind of given the given the situation. And because that was part of my thought when you uh, when you listed off kind of the the five young, uh, what was it, between sixteen and twenty one year old attacking midfielders. Yeah, I mean, my thought was, you know, kind of in a vacuum, we look at each of them, and they all have the potential to be very good players and very good pros. And in my mind, I was just thinking, let two of these guys hit, you know, and let the rest of them just be solid pros and, you know, maybe you sell them to, you know, whatever happens, they get loaned out, they get sold out. But if you get two guys who, who hit and kind of maximize 80, 90% of their, of their potential, 
you've you've really got something. And you know, it's kind of the the same situation. There's there's a couple of defenders, and you know, you, you just need one hit. And at least when you can lock down one position, at least that's that's a thing that sort of for one January or one summer at least, like we don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. You know, we have this is a thing that we have. So we, we can we can start we can start trying to address other needs. But I, I totally agree. And I think that's the thing with Nico Gonzalez too. It's like, I mean, Sergi Busquets is still Sergi Busquets. Like he's brilliant. You know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't move quite as, you know, quite as well or quite as much, but you know, he's still kind of that guy. Like he's, he's a maestro and he, he sees the game and he sort of feels the game in a way that very few people ever have. But there's going to come a point where just you know age and time and wear and tear do their do their dirty work, and you know he's not going to be able to suit up for 80, 85 minutes, sixty times a season. And the fact that there is someone that you can at least kind of realistically dream on being a a reasonable facsimile of him, and kind of where the of course there will be a drop off, but the drop off won't be so stark. And maybe you gain a little bit physical, you know, kind of in, in energy and stamina that, you know, where, where you might lose in kind of innate brilliance and, and experience and knowledge. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see if there is sort of a, a vision for the future of, uh, of the, the Barca midfield and kind of the, the defensive midfield role there. And yeah, so, I mean, on the point yeah, of Busquets, I mean, on the point of Busquets, I, I'm interested as well to see how similar this Barcelona team this year, just looking at the way the roster has changed ever so slightly. I think that it would behoove Ronald Koeman to look at what Luis Enrique did for Spain and try mm-hmm. to play as similar to that as possible. I mean, you yeah. look at how good Pedri was for Spain, how good Busquets, I mean, night and day was Spain when Busquets came out of COVID protocol. So yeah. starting that second game and after the pre, I mean, so the lead up to the Euro, those friendlies, Spain looked yeah. not great, not like a favorite. And then the first game they, against Sweden, they struggled. And all of a sudden, yeah. here comes Busquets. And from there on out, every time he was on the field, which is every minute, basically, they were the better team. They were the better side. I, even against Italy, they were the better side. And they, they were up. an attacking juggernaut when, yeah. when Busquets came in. And just, you know, I mean, in terms of creating chances, I mean, they, you know, it was ever the ever the problem like they needed to to deposit some more of them into the yeah. goal but like, and and, and Barcelona won't have a number nine like crazy yeah I mean the Barcelona won't have a number nine either uh but mm-hmm. if you replace Danny Olmo and again no disrespect to Danny Olmo but if you replace Danny Olmo with Lino Messi right you're talking about you're talking about wins you're talking about a, a really dominant side and yeah I mean part of me says that Pedri is I, I did this what last week or two weeks ago about how he can improve and how he can get better. And it's just doing the good things that you see him do and doing those more and doing right. those consistently over the course of 90 minutes and just being a game breaker five, six, seven, eight times a game instead of just two or three, which is what he does now. So it's just being more consistent because of how solid a player he is. 